looking to expand his own knowledge of pipe reline and infrastructure rehabilitation, Brent Eckhart embarks on the journey into the no-day construction world while interviewing experts in all facets of the industry. Hoping to find answers here is Brett Eckhart with Reline Unknown. I made my way over to sunny Denver, Colorado and sat down with two super knowledgeable industry experts from American West Construction, Paul Snyder and Jude Cobb. I know I learned a lot from these guys and I hope you guys do as well. All right guys, sitting here with uh, the guys from American West Construction. Thanks for guys, take, taking your time. You bet. We've already had a pretty good time BSing, but I figured it's time to put the cameras on and put the mics on and try and get to the bottom of uh, some of the stuff we were talking about earlier. So I did a little research on American West Construction, founded in 2002, correct? Yes. And on your website, you guys kind of talk about how you kind of got into the reline industry, and that's what we're here to talk about. So, either of you? Well, it was before, it was before, before Jude's me. time, but okay. um, we, we were on a Colorado, Colorado DOT CDOT project up on Vail Pass. When a flood came and or a heavy rain came and uh, collapsed a culvert that was underneath I-70 and shutting down the interstate, that um, we were there and helped fix the uh, culvert. It was a three-month job. That precipitated uh, CDOT looking at all their culverts across the entire state, state, and the result was that they found many culverts that were in really bad shape, and so CDOT. Um, started on a reline project or rehabilitation of many of the CMPs, corrugated metal pipes, um, to prevent another collapse. Um, so we got into that business kind of by default. We The first contract that CDEP put out to bid was in 2004, and uh, we happened to be the low bidder on the job and went and started relining pipe at the time with um, some HDPE liners. And that's really how we got into it. And since then, um, we've probably done $25 million worth of lining on, well, I don't know, three or four dozen different projects throughout Colorado and in a couple other states as well. So, um, Idaho yeah. being one of them. We talked about Idaho is being Idaho. one of them, yeah. That's that was kind of a, in our home base, so I, I kind of like to hear that one. Yeah, sure. Yeah. That, that, was a, uh, that was a little bit different than a culvert lining, but that was a... Um, Siphon that runs uh, on underneath Siphon Road in Pocatello or Chubbuck, Idaho. Yeah. It was uh, the siphon and the water zone by the Indians um, on the reservation just north of there. The project was for the Bureau of Indian Affairs, um, and that particular project was to line a cast in place concrete pipe. Um, the pipe was built in, I think, 1902, mm -hmm. was lined in steel in 1940, and here it was 2014, and they needed it relined. So we actually, our contract was to line the middle section of a, gee, it was, must have been a roughly a mile long pipe, Jude? Yeah, it was close. So we did a couple thousand feet in the middle. Yeah. Um, the first section had been lined a few years earlier. We lined the middle section, and I understand from you that the the next phase, the last it's phase coming is coming out. out so yeah. yeah. So what product did you guys line? The when so you said there was a section line. It was lined with steel in the forties, and there was a section line before you guys did the middle section under the railroad. If I Correct. Recall. Yeah. And what was the product that you guys used to line that middle section with? That was the Hoboss, which Hoboss. is a Hoboss. fiberglass polymer. polymer pipe. Yeah. So Hoboss is a polymer. Um, <clears throat> it's a fiberglass reinforced pipe. Okay. They had okay. to use that pipe because there was like 5 PSI pressure, 7 PSI. The pipe had to be able to take a little bit of pressure. So without like, doing a full-on um, fusion weld, I mean, it, could, it didn't need that much pressure. It just had to have, so the whole boss could do the job. So right. Nice. Right. Okay. Yeah, it was a bell and spigot, um, but low low PSI, but still it was a pressure pressurated pipe. Okay. Okay. So... Real quick, just to give just to give everybody kind of a rundown. So, what is your guys' what what is your roles at American West? Um, so I'm the president. Okay, I'm the estimator. One yes. of the estimators. Yes. 
So in order to be the president at some point, you had to be the estimator. Yes, I was the estimator <laughs> until I found Jude. <laughs> uh, right, but Jude, right. Jude's uh, uh, done most of our estimating for um, culvert lining and is very familiar with all the processes. And um, his background has been, you know, pipe as well as concrete. He's done. He's been a, a public work estimator, heavy civil estimator for. A long time, Jude. Yeah, thirty-five years. <laughs> thirty-five yeah. years, and so he's not only superintendent, to, project manager, and yeah, estimator. He's really. done kind of all those, all those different. Uh, From Louisville, Louis, Louisville, Louisville, and Kentucky. How long have you been living in uh, Denver? Uh, all together about ten years. Okay, I like it. I like it. So, obviously. If you, you started in 2002, but you got into kind of the reline business with American West in 2003 with the, the big CDOT jobs, had you been involved in any of the reline um, industry, doing any reline previous to that? Um, I know you have. You have some history. In not not prior to American West. I don't ever recall doing any. I've spent okay. different things in my career, but not, not any reline. I would tell you that I don't think there was much of a reline business prior to 2004 in Colorado. I could be wrong. Somebody could say that that's not the case, but CDOT, had, I don't think they had done, and I'm unaware of any other lining projects they've done prior to their 2004 job. Mm -hmm. um, and since then, they've I don't know, they've done several projects a year, maybe well, two to three projects a year since 2004. So yeah maybe 30 projects all in total. And those projects typically have been multiple sites, multiple locations. Um, so and Probably some of our, um, you guys run into a lot of similar stuff we do like in the Idaho areas. Your, your, your infrastructure is still fairly new compared to Midwest, East, that the reline just hasn't caught on or hasn't been as much of a necessity as it has been. Um, in those areas, I would assume that's why it hasn't really started taking hold, or people just started realizing, hey, we're gonna have to do something about some of these existing culverts that need fixed. Yeah, many of the. <clears throat> Go ahead, Jude. Well, some of the things that have come along in Colorado that are unique is that, that the amount of cover that's over the existing pipe. That the the chance of trying to dig up the pipe and replace it would be. Even if it wasn't under 8570, if it's just under some state road, there's still 40 feet of, pipe, of dirt on top of the pipe. It's just digging it up would be a monumental task. Well, and that's like on your website, the, the main picture, you can see where that pipe's coming out, right? And was it highway, is it 70 here? The one that you guys first did? I-70. I-70. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can see there's some pretty good cover yeah, on I mean, that pipe. Yeah. Like, you, you have to line it, essentially. I mean, that road was... Yeah, and you know, many of the roads, the first culverts we lined were typically mountain roads. <clears throat> the mountain, you know, what you find in the mountains, as Judah said, steep canyons, mountainous terrain, so these roads sometimes have, you know, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 feet of fill on top of these culverts. Um, plus, <clears throat> most of these culverts in the mountains, many of them have very steep grades. So what has happened over the years, they probably accelerated the, the um, the decay of some of these CMPs because when the water melts, <clears throat> the snow melts, it carries bed load or rocks, mm -hmm. and the rocks tumble down the corrugations. They beat the corrugations to flat. They um, beat the, the galvanization off, which then the, the stream dries up in the fall. Now you've got rust, and it just accelerates the decay. And so most of the culvert lining we have done Early, you know, so I'd say 24 or 2004, 5, 6, 7, all those were mountain projects. Okay. Um, so those were typically the, some of the worst culverts that, that we saw. Um, it's it's so, just like that's how the municipalities go. Like they start with the very worst and then they start working back. Chipping backwards. away. So you got to kind of start with what needs addressed right now, essentially. And in fact, CDOT, the Colorado DOT, has a critical culvert list, and they have way more culverts to fix than they have money to, to spend. So Another um, common theme. <laughs> yes, another common theme. So they, they chip away, you know, the worst culverts um, and, you know, try to get as much done as they possibly can with a finite budget. So, um, okay. yeah. So was there a learning curve as you guys kind of got deeper into the reline? Um, 
industry and looking at more pipes and more potential projects? Was there anything that kind of threw you for a loop or something that kind of caught you off guard at all, or was it the, anything specific? The amount of water that flows under the pipe can get to be as big of a problem as about anything else. The, the existing stream bed, when they put the pipe in, they'll, they'll be where the stream was, that's where you put the pipe, and then the water continues to run underneath there, and if there's holes in the pipe, it's coming up into the... So when you reline on a deal like that, does it fix it? I mean, because you've already obviously created the issue now underneath the pipe, is there, I mean, how, does it does it help? I mean, how do you fix that? Because you're not going to dig out underneath the pipe where there's been wash or no. whatever. Well, there, any, any uh, degradation in the flow line of the pipe is repaired before the liner is put in. Okay. About any kind of liner, we've done some kind of repairs. The water that flows under the pipe is going to be slow, uh, flowing a lot slower just okay. because of all the friction going through all the rocks and everything. And if it was going there before, it's still going there now. It just can't get back into the pipe. Okay. Once, once the liner is complete. So there'll still be some water running underneath there. Yeah, you know, they call it, I think in the engineering world, they call it piping. And especially underneath a dam, it's a big issue. <clears throat> you don't want the fines, the small particles, leaving with the water. So that's the a big concern with dams is when the CMP, let's say the invert gets rusted out, and now water is flowing around the pipe and it's starting to take fines out. Um, that, that'll create a void and potentially a collapse. And then ultimately, that's what happened on the first job we fixed on the Vail Pass, was there, the invert was mostly gone, and then it started taking some of the fines, and then the gully washer came, a, you know, a storm came with some really high flows to the pipe, and that was enough to cause the, the, a sinkhole, create a sinkhole, and then eventually collapse the pipe and the sinkhole shut down the interstate. So hmm. um, to fix it, yeah, you know, you might not fix that piping problem underneath the highway. We have had instances where we're lining the pipe with an HDPE liner, and then they fill, we fill the space between the liner and the existing pipe. That's called the annular space. We fill that with a cellular grout, a low, uh, high mobility, what I would consider, you know, a, a high mobility grout that um, is lightweight, and um, we've had instances before where we've, you know, the theoretical volume um, we've blown by, you know, factors of, of what the quantity has been because maybe there's a break in the pipe and the, the grout will actually flow outside of the host pipe and start filling the voids outside the pipe. <clears throat> so in that, those scenarios, um, the owner... Usually, most of the engineers we talk to, they they'll they have said, well, you know, there's a void there, and if it's getting filled with grout, well, then great. Unfortunately, yeah. in that scenario, it may cost the owner more money because, of course, they're paying for more grout. More so, grout. Um, that is that is an issue from an owner's perspective of, well, how do I make sure that I'm not, um, you know, spending tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars on extra grout if uh, you know there's a big void. So, so in the West and this is something I, I've never really thought that much about, but it makes sense, is in the West, there's, a, there's we have a lot of dams. So there is, I would assume, I mean, and some of these dams have been in place for a considerable amount of time. So I would assume that the dam work alone, let alone the culverts and the existing pipe on the ground, there's, there's got to be a lot of work in dams out there in even just the Northwest. I mean, we were talking about, you know, some Wy Wyoming and over here, um, is that something you guys specialize in, or is it is it just part of the, the nature of the beast? Is, is is that is there is it there more dam work, less dam work uh, coming up, or you guys see in the future, or is it just kind of take it as it comes? We'll take all the dam work we can get. <laughs> I, <like it. laughs> I set it up. I set it up. Not even on purpose, but I'll take it. <laughs> um. No, yeah, I mean, we've seen more dam rehab projects, and we've done several of them here in Colorado. Mm -hmm. And to your point, a lot of, uh, I think a lot of the dams that were built in the 40s and 50s and 60s, they have culvert pipes in their outlet works, and, you know, those culvert pipes are designed for a 50-ish year um, design life, and so now we're starting to see 
some failures there. So yes, we, you know, that's something we specialize in. We've done several of them over the last few years. I think it's, if you talk to engineers that are in, in the dam um, safety or dam um, industry, uh, there's a lot more work that's going to, we're going to start to see more and more of that work is the bottom line. So when I was with Interflow, um, we don't Interflow, we looked at a lot of levee stuff, you know, and because the levees are big, you know, in that area, you know, not as much in Nebraska. Stuff. Yeah, there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of levee stuff, which I, I, being from Boise, Idaho, I never really even seen a levee. I didn't even know what a levee did. So I kind of had a whole new um, learning curve on, okay, how does a levee work? What's the purpose of a levee? And how does that, and so now they're going through and systematically um, with the Army Corps going through and looking at all the levees, which is, I mean, to me, it's kind of a similar, similar to a dam, but just different capacity. So that's, that was Jude's first job here at American West. We did a job in Sioux Falls, South Dakota to do a, uh, to do some lining of, uh, I don't remember what kind of pipe, but there were different kinds of pipe. They, they had been put in when the levy was done, but somehow the core didn't have, their strength wasn't right. Mm -hmm. They're supposed, supposed to use class five pipe and they use class three. They need to put the line in for additional strength. It wasn't as much a failure deal as it was in increased uh, a loading on the on the pipe. Okay. That was, yeah. we that was that. Jude's first job here, so. You, you were right in the fire. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. We put him right in the one breach, way to so. start. <laughs> That's it, right in the fire. Yeah. So, is there a certain type of um, like pro like products that you guys prefer to use, like to use, or is it? I mean, you guys pretty much Swiss Army knife, but a reline, a little bit of everything, or I mean, is there something you guys more heavily focus on or not here in American West? Well, I would tell you, I think we have we are maybe a jack of all trades. We've we are maybe the Swiss Army knife. Our experience has been, you know, we started in two thousand four with a HDPE liner, um, and most of these jobs that we're doing, these projects have multiple sites, multiple pipes, and we've done many jobs that have all kinds of different processes to line, whether it's cure in place pipe or slip lining with HDPE or using centrifugally cast concrete pipe which is called spin casting. Um, ultimately, you know, we've done a we've done all kinds of pipes with all different products. So um, I think the takeaway from our oh I don't know, fifteen years of experience in culvert lining is that not every project lends itself well to you know every different lining technique so in other words usually there's one or two constraints on a site or a location that kind of drives the decision on which kind of liner to use obviously cost being probably the primary factor right you could use yeah. you could use any kind of liner on any kind of pipe but if you're trying to be um, cost conscious there's usually the, the optimal solution so um, I think that's the one of the biggest thing that we've learned, and um, so we have our hand and all a lot of different techniques on how to line pipe. It seems like I mean, the more people I talk to, the more I realize that it just seems like there's there's a certain type of product for every type of job, and there's really no one size fits all. So, if you're trying to grow your business in the on the reline side, you kind of want to be able to handle a little bit of everything. I mean, that's kind of how you're gonna grow without trying to shove one type of product at every single job and do it the right way. I mean, it's kind of seems like that's the approach you're taking. Yeah, it is. I think that's the approach. You know, the, I think for any owners out there, the one thing that I've learned, we've, um, we've done a lot of value engineering after we've been awarded a project. <clears throat> so the, the project has been designed for one type of lining and invariably we'll be able to come to the table and uh, bring maybe a better solution um, or cheaper or you know faster solution um, to lining so um, because of course we've seen all the different processes and techniques to line pipe whereas maybe a government agency isn't familiar with centrifugal cast concrete pipe or spin casting is it's kind of you know the common name um, or cure in place pipe or whatever there's always mm -hmm. um, you know, there's always, there's things that we've done and projects we've uh, had different types of techniques used on that, you know, likely we can bring to the table. So 
Um, you know, we're big proponents of design building projects. Have you guys ever been brought into a job that wasn't done correctly the first time and by somebody else or something you had to kind of come in and fix it because it wasn't the right application wasn't used? I mean, you don't have to name the specific job or contract. I don't really care about that, but it was it because I just, I think it's important for people to understand that there is a right type of product for the, every, for the, for the specific job. And if you can spend a lot, you can think you're saving money on the, on the front end because you're going a little cheaper or whatever the case may be. But the reality is if you got to do it twice, it doesn't matter how much it costs the first time because you're, you're coming to have to come back and do it again. So I don't know if you guys, have you ever ran into that or has it always been, have you been able to, you know, I don't think I, don't, I haven't. We've gone in after anybody that's done done the work right to begin with. Okay. Yeah. Which is good. Well, I mean, that, I mean, that's a, that's well. A we've good done thing. quite a few, so I hope the answer is no <laughs> to anybody you speak to. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly the ones that you have done. Um, no, I, there's not a single one that I can think of that was done that way. I would tell you that um, most of the culvert lining that we've done, so. The process is to clean the pipe, maybe fix any, maybe there's an invert that's missing on the pipe, and so maybe you have to fill that somehow with grout or concrete or something. We could say that the Pocatello job that we went back in. Yeah, after 100 years, they, after 110 years, we had to fix the Pocatello job, so yeah. Whoever... I saw the steel on that. <laughs> the, guy, um, the guy in uh, Chubbuck City, he showed me the, I can't remember what the thickness was of the steel that they lined that pipe with, but it was stout it was a stout liner a for because it wasn't galvanized if i recall no no nope, it was not i think it was tar coated yeah maybe and and so that and that thing it to last what they put it they relined it in the 40s till here what five years ago i think you said yeah. was it? And the, low, it? the low part of it set full of water every, every year when they stop using the siphon the bottom of it sits full of water as it evaporates out so it's got all that oxidation to go on yeah the concrete, when we actually, we had to bust through the concrete, the rebar on the concrete was a uh, twisted square bar, which is oh, wow. from 1902 or 5 or whenever it was, the early 1900s, so it wasn't like rebar we have today, it was square bar that was twisted. That's crazy. Yeah. You think about it. I mean, just think about that. And you said that was a cast in place. Cast in place. Cast in place. Yeah. yeah. And you don't see that anymore. What's we had to do quite a bit of chipping to make because the pipe was cast out of round, so we had to we had to do quite a bit of manually chipping the concrete um, to make sure the round the round hoboss pipe would fit inside the host pipe. Hmm. Yeah. Um, but so what I was going to tell you is, um, so the lining process is you know typically clean the pipe, divert flows if there are, line the pipe, or I mean uh, clean the pipe. Fix the invert if it needs to be fixed. Then you um, put in a liner if it's going to be an HDB liner, if that's the process, or if it's if it's a spin cast, then you spin it. Um, but with the H with HDPE, after the HDP is in place, we'll fill the annular void again, the space between the the liner pipe and the host pipe with a cellular grout, and you know that process. It's not as complicated as a bridge deck pour, mm -hmm. but it's somewhat like a bridge deck pour in that um, when you're building a bridge, you got the formwork, you got the rebar, and once you start pouring a bridge deck, you got to finish pouring a bridge deck. You kind of get one chance at it, and if you miss, mess it up, that's a whole lot of cost to get to that point. That's why um, usually when there's a bridge deck pour for the contractors that are bridge contractors, they know what I'm talking about. It's pretty stressful to make sure that everything goes off without a hitch. You got a pump truck that can't fail, a bridge deck finish that can't fail, concrete needs to be right, um, the weather's got to be right, so there's a lot of um, outside influences that um, are impacting the project. And that's similar to culvert lining, when you get to the annular space grouting, you got to make sure it's done right, because if you don't do it right, um, I don't know, you know, the cost to repair or fix would be potentially astronomical. I mean, that's, so it's, um, you got to make sure that the grout is right, and then it completely fills the um, annular space. And then I think the two things that, if you're new to the culvert lining business, pipes um, have a collapse pressure. 
and annular space grout, it's hydraulic, so um, imagine taking a empty gallon milk jug and pushing it down in a swimming pool. At some point in time, that that um, pressure on that pipe may collapse. So depends on the depth you go. Depth, yeah, yeah, it's a depth issue and what the right. d the density of the grout is. In addition to that, on larger diameter pipes, there's an issue with um, flotation. So you can get a pipe collapse because when you start to fill the the pipe up, it acts like a boat. And so there's a pressure on the outside of the pipe when it um, starts pressing up against the, the rails that we install in between the liner and the host pipe. So the bridge, the, the annular space grouting can be somewhat tricky. Um, you gotta make sure the density is right. And you, you typically don't, in larger diameter culverts, you don't, have, you don't grout in one day. It takes multiple days to grout. So um, it's not just dump the grout in and turn your head and go. Um, you got to be, you have to think about what all is going on. There's a little bit of engineering that's involved in it. So the advantage of, say, a, a solid wall um, type reline is you do get the advantage of getting more structure by filling the angular space. If there was any degradation on the top or bottom, whatever, you get a little bit more structure. But the disadvantage is all the things that have to go right yes. when you're actually filling the annular space with the grout. So it's kind of a catch-22. It can be advantageous because you get the structure, but you, this, you know, the disadvantage is if, if you better hit a home run, almost. I mean, on, on large diameter stuff anyways, right? Yeah, for sure. Is that what you're, I mean, if, that if, what you're if it, communicating? If the pipe me? floats, it'll collapse the top of it in. You can deform the top of the you, pipe you and collapse the, the top. pipe that's inside there. Yeah, I've then. seen a couple. I've got a couple of pictures on my phone of some that I've seen in the Midwest over in uh, Kentucky Louisville area, and you can see where it's buckled the joint on on a mechanical joint saw wall where it's just pushed, and you can see the grout seeping out of the top of it. Um, so I, I I've seen what you're talking about firsthand. That, that's why you got the different levels in the whale light pipe, the the one one sixty, you know, the different ratings, two fifty, yeah. the three different ratings in the in the pipe. And and somebody can, the other thing that I think, and you guys could touch on this, you guys are gonna have a better idea than I. But on the grout, I mean, it's it's not just any kind of grout. Like there's a special formula you have to have as far as for that grout, because it can't be a super heavy grout, right? I mean. From a mix standpoint, do you, do you guys get any info on that that part of it for me? We've done mix designs on it, so okay. that's, that's something that's that, you know. That what determines the mix design, and what determines the the, the specifications are call for a certain density, so many pounds per cubic foot, generally. Okay. And a PSI rating, they mm -hmm. want to. Um, Super strength. You know, the, the challenge we've run into sometimes is a a uh, engineer will specify a. 2,000 psi grout, and a 2,000 psi grout does not flow. And you would, really, what you, my perspective is, you want a grout that flows. It's got, it's relatively weak, but the challenge is to get really higher strength grout. Now you have to add, you know, more cement and potentially sand and maybe pea gravel. Well, if you're doing that, it's not a, it's not an annular space grout. It's got to be something that, that has low viscosity that's going to move and um, you know, flowable, flowable. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay. So th there's, you know, again, there's a science to it. Um, as Jude said, you know, we'll do a mixed design. Um, and then, um, you know, some engineers want just grout. Um, we use cellular grout, which has little foam bubbles in it, and um, its density is a lot lighter, so there's ability to grout more put more grout in and get the grouting done ultimately the grout really serves as kind of a load transfer between the host pipe and the liner pipe okay most of the jobs we've been on the owner wants a pipe that can that can handle the loading as if the the, the pipe was by itself um, having gone through the you know the infancy here in Colorado of what the what CDOT wanted um, you know, it's a pretty complex calculation to figure out what's the capacity of a CMP that may be partially degraded that has annular space grout around an existing pipe. That is a complex engineering question. 
Yeah. Um, and I'm an Over my head. That's and, for and I'm an engineer, and I'm, <laughs> but not a very good one. And I, what I know is that it's a horribly complex uh, calculation, if you can even, if it's even possible. Ultimately, where we land on it is we size pipe and require pipe to carry the load as if there's no other existing pipe or um, annular space grouting there. So if the if the liner pipe can withstand the loading, then you know it's good. And but in between the host pipe and the liner pipe, you need something to transfer the loads. Okay. So that's what that annular space grout does. It's a void filler, so it doesn't need to be, you know, horribly um, strong or. It doesn't you know, need to be stronger than the dirt that's backfilled the original pipe. So it just needs to fill the space. Fill the space, right? And ultimately, the, the number here in Colorado is they typically require 300 psi an annular space grout, um, okay. and they leave is it to that, the contractor to design that. And is that and that seems to vary state to state, right? It I mean, does spec to spec. I mean, if there's one thing I've learned about the reline industry so far is that it can vary state to state. The specs are vastly different. What what one state expects or what another state expects, it seems like it's, and you'd think that the states that have been doing reline for years and years and years have it all figured out, but I, I don't think that's the case either. I think that it's, it just depends on the engineering firm as much as anything. That's my two cents on it, but if. It's, you know, even in, so in Colorado, the regions, there's five regions, there's, and the regions are decentralized, so each region kind of has its own processes, and of course there's a state standard specification that governs it, but um, I don't believe there's, in, a, in the CDOT standard specification across the entire state, there is no standard for culvert lining, so that leaves each region to design it themselves. And across the state, region to region, for the same entity, <laughs> there's variation. Varies, yeah. Um, and so, um, yeah, that can pose a little bit of a challenge. So if it varies from, if it varies from just region in, in, inside of one state, it can really vary across the, the country. So I, real quick, I, I talked to you guys earlier. The one thing I appreciate about American West is that you guys are start to finish. I mean, you guys are... You guys are doing the grout yourselves. Yep. On the spray line, you guys are certified. Um, um, what's the term? Certified yeah. applicators. Yeah. So you guys are spraying it yourselves. Extrusion yourself. welding. Extrusion, extrusion welding it yourselves. I mean, a lot of people farm a lot of that stuff out or whatever, but you guys are doing it from start to finish. So I can appreciate that about you guys. So is there one project in mind that you've done that's kind of your... I don't know, trophy on the mantle, like that you guys like kind of hang your hat on that you're proud of. If anybody ever said, hey, give us a, you know, tell us the one that, and it could be one that was like a challenge that you guys kind of overcame, or is there one out there that's your. We did one recently up at Hamilton Gulch. <clears throat> oh, it yeah. was a, it was a CDOT job, um, Colorado DOT job west of the Eisenhower Tunnel, about an hour west of Denver. Um, the original pipe was a 60 inch pipe. I don't know, 40 foot of fill on top of it, as Jude had oh, mentioned. 75 feet was, of fill. Yeah, so 75 feet of fill, it was a 60 inch pipe. And then at some point in time, I don't know when, maybe the 70s, CDOT built a runaway truck ramp um, right at Hamilton Gulch. So during that construction they had a 48-inch uh, pipe, I believe it was 48-inch, at about a 6% slope that tied into the 60-inch pipe. Yeah. So we have a significant run of 60-inch or a 48-inch pipe at a 6% slope tying into a 60-inch at a 2% slope underneath 70 feet of fill and it was always running water. There were some under drains that tied into the, that point in the pipe, so there was groundwater coming at us through under drains. Flow all year in the channel. All year long. In the channel, not just the groundwater. And in the channel, yeah. So there was huh. a lot water of water. water divert. The outlet pipe was about 100 feet below I-70 on a one-and-a-half to one slope, so there was no access on the outlet. Um, Way down to the bottom. When you came out the end of the pipe, it stuck at the end of the of the embankment, embankment and it dropped down 
30 feet. Yeah. And so we had to line the pipe from the uphill side. Um, but to do it, we had to have, um, we had to bypass the stream that was, you know, flowing. Um, so we fuse welded a couple, well, I think 30, 36 inch HTP liners to, uh, not liners, but pipe to bypass the flow. And then the, the trick, the biggest question was what length of pipe can you get and what's the bending radius of that pipe to be able to make the sweep from a 48 inch pipe that's at 6% that meets a 60 inch pipe at 2%. So um, we had to figure that out and the engineer required a minimum ID pipe of, I can't remember, 30 inch or 36 inch, whatever it was. Mm -hmm. So was it a corrugated steel It was pipe? a corrugated metal pipe that... Two, two different installations. Two different yeah, installations. Two different yeah. Yeah. different sizes. Yeah. Okay. And so the, the biggest challenge was, can we get the pipe through that radius? And again, we only have an access from the uphill side. And then the second challenge, biggest challenge was, what do you do with the water that's coming at you at the middle of the pipe? It's these are two under drains that's stuck into the host pipe. What do, how do you, what do you do with them during the grouting process? So um, it was a pretty challenging project. And as I recall, uh, we were the low bidder and there was one other bidder and um, when the engineer called us and he said, well, how are you going to do that? I think my question, my comment or my answer was, well, I'm not exactly sure. We, I think we have a plan. <laughs> <laughs> I think I got so, so what did you put? So what did you, what was the, the liner? What did you put in it? We used a solid wall HDPE, but fuse welded it. Uh, it was no, no, it was solid it was wall. Solid wall. Yeah, it was solid wall pipe. But fused it from the from the from the uphill side. I and believe. Slid it and slid it down. down. And um, we had done a bunch of surveying. Well, surveying maybe a a, a term. We did a bunch of measuring. Internal and, measurements. Internal yeah. measurements, and then we put it into AutoCAD to make, and then figured out what the bending radius of a certain uh, DR rating on eight on the on the solid wall pipe would be to make sure that it would actually bend through that. Um, so that's that's how we lined it. <laughs> and then when we're at the, the bend, uh, the existing host pipe, um, uh, we, uh, before we, I think we, we lined it, um, we had a break, didn't we? I think we lined it in two different sections, or we lined the 60 inch, and then we came in and attached some pipes to the under drains, um, mm -hmm. so, we wouldn't have to fight groundwater during the annular space grouting. Um, so if that makes any sense, it's kind of hard to oh, explain. Yeah. No, but, I understand. Um, I mean, we had to catch that water. We had to catch yeah. that water. We just couldn't let it run. So um, yeah, it was it was pretty that's a challenging. Project. It was quite yeah. a, it was quite a project. It was yeah, a fun time. We had to put our thinking cap on to make sure that we had it. Well, and those are the fun ones, and those are the ones you know when you then when you run into the easier ones, or when you when you go and you tell somebody, hey, like. We're in the reline industry. We 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 can tackle this project because we've tackled this project and kind of right. you know it gives you that little bit of you know. Yeah, it's not until you get into some of those um, projects that are challenging like that. Well, and again, the Pocatello job or the Chubbuck job uh, was another case where well, how do you marry up a liner pipe? In the middle of a pipe, so the upper end is lined, the down, downstream end isn't. And you can put a liner pipe in. You know, it's not a perfect circle. It's not a perfect not. circle. So we had to create insertion pits, and um, you know that was that was another one that was really challenging. I mean, the concept of well, how do you prevent the Hobos pipe from floating? Mm -hmm. Well, we used water inside the pipe to ballast that oh. as ballast. So yeah. that prevented the pipe from floating. Well, what, it, yeah. what kind of plug do you need to put in a, uh, what size was that, 84 inch or? Yeah. 84 inch Hobos pipe that's holding 200,000 gallons of water. What kind of plug do you need to have in that pipe to hold that water? And then think about, well, how do you get the plug out? Because now you've got an uphill end, uh, the uphill access, you can't get to the downhill plug. You could get to the downhill plug because it was a siphon. So how do you actually deflate the plug to let the water out? I mean, these are... You can't be on the downstream yeah. end of the plug when you let the water out because it would 
there's 200,000 gallons of water coming at you. So how did you do it? We will very carefully. <laughs> <laughs> Is that a trade secret? I'm okay with it. <laughs> yeah, we, we, we were able to do it. Um, again, one of those things where um, our our project manager came up with a plan to, to do it from up. We cord through the the existing line and we're able to do it that way to deflate the plug. But had that not worked, the backup plan, I'm not exactly sure what the backup plan would have been. So it was one of those things where you got a plan, you cross your fingers, and away you go. So, oh, it works. Yeah. So, so those, seems are, those like, are the fun jobs. Yeah, it seems like, I mean, on the reline side, because it is even it is fairly new, and when I say new, the last, say, 30 years, because it's, it's, it's a... It's a it's something that we have to address as a country, like the infrastructure. You hear people talk about infrastructure this, infrastructure that, and it's we haven't been relining pipes for 100 years. I mean, relatively speaking, at least not with the products that we have today, with you know the central pipe and the you know the solid walls, whether it's a Snapchat or a whale light or whatever. You just there's new products coming out. Um, is there anything out there? You guys, go, you guys went to the new No Dig show in Chicago. It sounds like is there anything? that you saw at the show that kind of piqued your interest a little bit? You're like, maybe i got to do a little more research into that product, or is there, I mean, is there anything that, is it just, you know, just trying to go there and learn, go to the classes, and, you know, try and pick some knowledge off, or? Yeah, I don't remember any um, epiphanies of, you know, any anything new. I think we've talked, we talked a little before about, there are new products out there, and, um, <clears throat> You know, there's a spiral wound product that is more of an uh, more for I think a sanitary sewer application, and um, I think the spin casting is is relatively new. It's it's only been in Colorado maybe five years, um, so that's maybe the newest okay. product that I've seen. I don't, I think there's you know everybody's looking at new products and techniques because ultimately. Um, most trenchless technologies are cheaper than the alternative of digging it up. Yeah. So I think the older our infrastructure gets, the tighter the budgets are, the more engineers and cities are looking, or, or municipalities or government agencies, or owners for that matter, are looking to maximize their dollar. So mm -hmm. why dig it up if you've got an alternative to line it? And I yeah. think, I think the trenchless technology is going to continue to grow because of that reason. Okay, that seems to me like a good, a good spot to end on. One last thing, and this is, this does has nothing to do with three line, but I got on your Facebook and looked at your website, and you guys have a couple of charities that you're involved in, and okay. I, that's, I love it. I mean, that's kind of like one of the reasons, one of the the best things about owning a small business is. You can kind of direct some funds to something that means something to you, as whether you're the president or you know if there's somebody that your company that's that's got something that means something to them and they want they want you to kind of get involved. Um, our thing is at breast cancer awareness in the state of Idaho. That's kind of my dad is the big driver of that. Can you touch on your guys's? What sure. Guys, what we'd, works for you we'd guys? be happy to. Yeah, you bet. I'd love to hear about the it. two charities that we support um, actively are Hope House of Colorado, which is an organization to help out unwed teen moms try to break the cycle of, uh, you know, um, dependency, and and ultimately they they take girls in that maybe had to drop out of high school before graduation um, because they were pregnant and had a child, and so they provide parenting classes and GED, and eventually. Um, they've had great success, and you know a lot of these young women with children or child um, have gone on to great things. They've um, maybe gone to college and graduated and been able to sustain themselves and their child. Um, so it's a really great organization, again, helping try to break that cycle of um, dependency. And um, then the other one is, and again, that's Hope House of Colorado. Uh, they've got a website you can go and. Yeah, I think they're a great organization. We'll, we'll post run. it, and we, we'll post up the website and everything for everybody right. to see. And the other one is Tennyson Center uh, for Children, which is a um, uh, charity or an organization that um, and they take in uh, abused kids through. Uh, they have a they have both a um, resident program, and then they also do a lot of other training with non residents non residents. And they you know the the stories um, from uh, some of these kids is tragic of what their home lives are. You know, it's an abusive situation, possibly, or you know, who knows? 
again, the stories are, are um, pretty dramatic, pretty tragic, and they take in these kids and help get them on a path to, um, you know, a better life. So um, that's, they're, they're yet again another great organization. Those are the two charities that we um, support actively. So. Well, I commend you guys for doing it. I mean, like I said, that's one of the beauties of being able to kind of direct some funds at people that they could use it. So thank you guys for the time. Great. I thank appreciate you. the Thanks. opportunity. America's aging underground infrastructure will need to be dealt with in the upcoming years. Our mission with Reline Unknown is to help individuals and organizations gain insight into the pipe, reline, and infrastructure world and help process the key decision, reline or replace. Thank you for listening.